Um, welcome. It's so good to see all of you here today. Um, and we're thrilled to have Dr. Anthony Howes, who is going to be our presenter for today. Um, we were chatting uh, just before the program, and uh, he was telling me that he joined um, the uh, Sudbury Companies of Minute and Militia in 1990. And how did that come about? Well, he and his wife, Annie, yep, there, she's, there she's somewhere, uh, there she is, <laughs> um, went to the Colonial Fair in September of that year, and, they, and Tony was literally blown away by it. it. He just loved it. Made some inquiries, I suppose, and decided to join it. And since then, he has been on every march um, on Patriot's Day to Concord. And he um, was also the colonel in the year 2000. Um, Tony is retired now, but he was in his uh, profession a radiation oncologist, trained and practiced at Stanford University. And he moved to Massachusetts in 1985. And he um, it happened to be staying at Harriet Wittenberg's house. It was a B&B. &B. Uh, they took the overflow from the Wayside Inn, and um, they were looking for a place to live. And as you, most of you probably know, Harriet Wittenberg's house was um, actually uh, owned by Ezekiel Howe, the innkeeper at the Wayside Inn during the Revolution. And um, they were looking for a place to live, and Harriet said, well, this is for sale, and isn't it nice that Dr. Howe's might live in the house that belonged to Mr. Howe? It just seemed like it was meant to be. Um, so anyway, um, that I think is, and, and when, and when uh, Tony and Annie moved here, uh, he um, became a part of the staff at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. So anyway, with, without further ado, let's turn this over to Tony Howes. Thank you. I, I don't ask for applause at the end of this presentation. All I ask is a 10-yard start. <laughs> right, I'm going. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, it's uh, a great honor to be able to talk about uh, the Sudbury Minute and Militia Companies that I've been a member of now for about 20 years and has now reached its 50th anniversary, and that's why we're doing this presentation. It's 50 years since it was first founded, and I see there are some of the founders present here today, and hopefully they'll be able to uh, make some comments on, on some of the things I've said, or will say. Um, to, to get the information for this presentation, I want to thank Lee and other members of the Historical Society for allowing me to wade through all the piles of, of records that are here. Um, also, uh, people at the Wayside Inn through, uh, with their archives, which were set up by Lee, I think, originally, uh, but they have a lot of stuff as well that pertains, pertains to all of this. And also to some of the, uh, the founders, particularly Joe Brown, who's here, Maurice Fitzgerald, Joe Bausk, um, who, who gave me lots of, of interesting stories. Um, uh, before we get into the current militia, I'd just like to spend a couple of minutes talking about uh, uh, the original militia and minute companies uh, in Sudbury in the Revolutionary War time. Uh, uh, as I'm sure you all know, uh, militia companies have existed in, in uh, British military history for a long, long time. And, and when the colonists came to New England, uh, it was expected that all uh, able-bodied men between 16 and 60 would drill uh, in the use of firearms and tactics uh, uh, for any kind of m military problems that might arise uh, in order to help the regular um, forces. Minutemen companies, interestingly, have also been around a long time. They didn't just start at the time of the Revolution. Uh, it was normal uh, amongst uh, British militia groups for them to select out a, a subgroup of elite uh, uh, militiamen um, who were trained uh, more than the regular m militia so that they'd be ready um, uh, to be the first in the battle whenever it came up. So this was a, an elite uh, select group. Um, as, as you know, during the French and Indian War, militia groups were expanded a lot and played an important part in that war. But once that war was over, militia groups tended to disband. It was relatively peaceful here. Um, people really didn't see the point of, of uh, drilling on a regular basis. And by the time of uh, the, uh, the impending American Revolutionary War, 
um, uh, it was realized um, that uh, things needed to change. And as you know, in uh, October 1774, Boston was under siege following passage of the Intolerable Acts, and um, uh, Massachusetts uh, was stripped of its self-government, and there was a large British uh, military buildup uh, in Boston. So the uh, Provincial Congress met in Concord to decide what they would do about it. And what they recommended is summarized here. They basically recommended that uh, the militias need to be expanded and to form themselves into companies of Minutemen who should be equipped and prepared to march at the shortest notice. These Minutemen were to consist of one quarter of the whole militia to be enlisted under the direction of the field officers, divided into companies consisting of at least 50 men each. The privates were to choose their captains and subalterns, and these officers were to form the companies into battalions and, chose, and to choose field officers to command the same, <coughs> which is important information because this is what we still try to do today. So, um, uh, in November of 1774, Thomas Plimpton, who was the representative to the uh, provis Provincial Congress, uh, moderated a Sudbury Town meeting and uh, it was voted that several companies of militia meet for the choice of officers for their respective companies as recommended by the Provincial Congress. So Thomas Plimpton was doing his duty and uh, re relaying that order. Um, at that time, Sudbury had a population of about 2,160 people with about 500 adult males aged between 21 and 98. Now most prominent, <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Most prominent, <laughs> Make, remember that there's going to be a question at the end. So that's one of, that's one of the Sudbury, um, uh, sorry, most prominent in the militia at that time uh, was Ezekiel Howe, who most of you know was an innkeeper of a modest uh, establishment down on the post road. Um, he'd been um, captain of the South Militia Company since the time of the French and Indian War. And this picture, and it's, it's, a, it's a, not a very good photograph, but of a copy, which is not a very good copy of his original commission paper in 1760, uh, as a captain of the uh, South Militia uh, Company. Um, uh, how he became a captain in the South Militia and eventually a colonel um, in the militia is, is a bit of a mystery to me. I couldn't find any records of his, of his war um, activities. The only thing I could find is that he entertained a lot of troops who came from the French and Indian Wars at one time in his inn, and I'm sure that uh, went a great way towards getting him a, a commission. But anyway, uh, Ezekiel Howe's uh, job um, as uh, what the leader of, of the militia and minute forces uh, in the town of Sudbury was to get these forces organized and to get their numbers uh, sorted out. And this is uh, the information he presented to a town meeting uh, in, in uh, um, early 1775. Um, all this information, if anyone wants to get some more information about uh, uh, build-up of forces and what was happening uh, at that time uh, as based in town meeting records. It's all recorded in, in a copy uh, called The War Years, uh, which uh, is on sale here on, on our sales desk. Don't know what it costs, but it's, it's well worth it. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but as you can see, these, uh, the, the militia companies uh, were divided into uh, three, the North, East, and South Militia Companies, and the Minute uh, Men Companies were divided into two, an East Side and a West Side Company. Um, altogether, we've got 346 men uh, enrolled, and of them, uh, 98 uh, are Minute Men. So that's about a third uh, of, of, the, of all the militia were Minute Men, um, which is about the, the proportion that was uh, uh, proposed at the Provincial Congress. They said about a quarter should be Minutemen, whereas here we had about a third. Um, but these were, were the companies as they were uh, delegated at that time. Now on the morning of April the 19th, 1775, hey Terry, <laughs> I saw it there. Um, uh, the, the alarm was brought to Sudbury, as, as I'm sure we all here know, uh, by um, Abel Prescott. This is a picture taken from David Hackett Fisher's book, Paul Revere's Ride, which goes into a lot of detail about how the alarm was carried throughout Middlesex County um, at that time. Um, and it originally came uh, from Boston to, to Concord uh, by Samuel Prescott, 
and his brother Abel Prescott brought it down to Sudbury and uh, apparently between three, three and four o'clock in the morning he got here. And in uh, Hudson's history he reports that um, Prescott uh, arrived at Thomas Plimpton's farm and informed him, him that the British were on their way to Concord and in 35 minutes the sexton was called upon followed by bell ringing, drum beating and discharge of muskets um, to give the alarm. Uh, following which the, the militia and Minutemen presumably mustered at their training grounds or other predetermined places um, and set off for Concord. Now we don't know exactly how, how they went um, but the best uh, idea we have is illustrated in this slide which is a little, little hard to see but here we are, here's Sudbury, Sudbury Centre and there's uh, the North Bridge uh, in Concord. And it looks like um, Ezekiel Howe, who was probably uh, sleeping comfortably at the wayside at the time, met up with uh, John Nixon's Minute Company and Moses Stone's Militia Company uh, in Sudbury Centre. Uh, where they set off north to Concord. Captain Aaron Haynes with the North Company and some of the uh, um, so-called alarm company, which was, wasn't on that muster roll, uh, but there was an alar alarm company of men who, uh, or boys even, who weren't normally considered to, to be uh, uh, able to join the militia groups. They could come along uh, if they desired, and s at least one of them in the name of Deacon uh, Joseph Haynes uh, joined Aaron Haynes' uh, company, and they head off. Now, it's, it's reported that um, uh, they, they all met up round about Duggan's Corner, and their plan was originally to go across the South Bridge into Concord. But round about here, um, they were met by Colonel Barrett's son, and he told him that the orders were that they should not go into Concord through the South Bridge, but they should go um, uh, past Colonel Barrett's farm. Uh, to a meeting point where all the other town militias were meeting just north of the North Bridge on Punkatasset Hill. Um, how they got across the river to get to Barrett's farm and the North Bridge uh, isn't recorded anywhere as far as I know. But it, it, becomes, it becomes quite, a, quite a, uh, uh, an important uh, uh, question as, as we get into all of this. There's, there's another interesting story that is documented that when they arrived um, uh, at Barrett's farm, they saw British soldiers um, looking for uh, various things at the farm and ransacking the place. So uh, Colonel, or Lieutenant, Co Lieutenant Colonel uh, Ezekiel Howe told them to wait here. He rode his horse past them to see what was going on. And he reports that once he got past Barrett's farm, he could hear firing at the North Bridge. Um, so he turned back. Um, the soldiers asked him where he was going and he said, oh, I, I fear there's trouble up ahead. Um, I need to get back to uh, my family. And they let him go. And when he got back to his men, they made their way to the North Bridge, presumably by going around Barrett's farm uh, through the woods or, or some way so they wouldn't be seen because the soldiers, as you know, were still at Barrett's farm when the fighting started on, on, on the bridge. So it's believed that the Sudbury troops, at least from the west side, um, arrived at the bridge sometime after the battle started. Uh, we don't know if it was over then. We suspect it probably was. But they then pursued uh, the British troops with um, uh, the other uh, militia and minute companies from the other towns that were there. Um, we know that they met up with other Sudbury minute and militia companies from the east side that had progressed presumably uh, in, on this sort of route uh, and they met up around about Hardy's Hill and Merriam's Corner. And they were involved in, in a lot of fighting at the Bloody Angle. Um, they, uh, they uh, finished that day. Some of them uh, pursued uh, uh, troops all the way uh, into um, uh, Boston and, and stayed there. But most of them returned um, after, after that day. Uh, two Sudbury men died that day, Deacon Josiah Haynes and Asahel Reed, and they were both uh, buried uh, in the Revolutionary Cemetery here, right next door. Um, Deacon Haynes' uh, tombstone is still visible and in pretty good shape, but Asahel Reed's is, is missing, and um, 
Uh, it's probably under the ground somewhere, and maybe one day someone will dig it out, right, Lee? Isn't that the plan? If, if we can find it. Um, so, following the um, War of Independence, uh, as you can imagine, uh, militia groups eventually disbanded. There really was no need for them. Um, they became unnecessary because there was a development of a standing army and a national guard. There was really no need for, for militia groups. And, and there really was uh, no uh, real celebration of, of this event um, until the first centenary. In 1875, um, there had been a holiday um, uh, around about that time in New England, a sort of a spring Easter type of holiday. And the towns of Concord and Lexington decided to use that day to celebrate um, April 19th. And the, and the battles at, at those towns. Um, Concord called it Concord Day, and Lexington called it Lexington Day. <laughs> um, uh, they, um, the, the idea of celebrating uh, April 19th as a holiday kind of caught on, but it wasn't really until 1894 that this man, who was Governor Frederick Greenhalg who was governor at the time, who interestingly was born in England, and you can tell he looks just like my grandfather. And um, he, uh, he um, was a veteran of the Civil War. And he agreed that April 19th should be a holiday uh, to celebrate not just the American Revolution, but as you probably remember, the, the Civil War started at Fort Sumter about April 19th, uh, very close to that day. So, so he declared April 19th to be a Massachusetts state holiday uh, re uh, celebrating both revolutionary and civil wars. Now these holidays tended to be festive affairs with fairs and eating and drinking and <laughs> partying. And people, some people even came up with the idea of, of a marathon race later on and uh, <laughs> caught on. And there really wasn't much interest in reenacting uh, the battles uh, that happened at that time until quite a bit later. One little um, snippet that I ran across going through the old newspapers was that in 1910, there was a small reenactment group from Sudbury got together and went to Marlborough to, to celebrate the centennial there. Um, I don't know what centennial that was because um, Marlborough was for, founded in 1660. So uh, what's 1910? I mean, what happened in 1810? Anyway, I, it's, I don't really care. Um, but what, the reason I, I, was, I was intrigued with this picture is that one of the um, uh, drummers, this chap, uh, it's called Fred Stone. And um, he uh, is one of the few survivors of that, that group who was around in, in a, uh, 1963 to form uh, a band for the uh, Sudbury uh, Mission Mini companies. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Now, um, nothing was really happening um, with reenacting at Concord uh, and Lexington until around about 1962. Concord was the first town to form a Minuteman reenactment company. And in fact, they, they celebrated their 50th anniversary last year at the Wayside Inn, of all places. Um, <laughs> um, but um, we didn't start here until 1963. Uh, now, why would that have been? Well, a lot of things were happening in this town in 1963. Um, Sumner Chilton Powell's book, A Puritan Village, was published. It was very successful, raising interest in the town's colonial history. And if you're interested, copies of that are available on our sales desk. <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't read it. Um, uh, the, La the, La the, La <laughs> the, La the Lafayette Memorial was dedicated to the Wayside Inn. Who knew that? And, um, and John Powers, interestingly, who was the town moderator at the time um, uh, and sort of amateur historian, uh, wrote a series of articles in the Fence Viewer relating to King Philip's War. And I suspect he was doing that while he was um, working on his, uh, his book, uh, We Shall Not Tamely Give It Up, which is a lot of stories uh, of... Uh, uh, historical stories of the town. And that's also on sale at our sales desk uh, at the very modest price of about two shillings and sixpence. Uh, but here's John Powers. I'm sure most of you knew him. Um, uh, he's quite a, a prominent figure in the town for a long time. Um, and Frank Copice, who was uh, innkeeper at the Wayside Inn at the time, tells the story that uh, John Powers came to him 
uh, one day and said he had gone to the Concord celebration on April 19th, uh, uh, where they had a little reenactment with their Minutemen, and only two people from Sudbury uh, showed up for that occasion. Um, jo Joe Brown, I believe you went to Acton to a similar uh, celebration. Acton also had a Minute uh, company. And again, Sudbury really wasn't rep represented there either. And so John Powers uh, uh, and probably many others uh, got together and decided Sudbury should do something. Uh, they played a prominent role that day. They probably had the largest group of minute and militia men. Um, and, and they marched all the way to Concord, which the Concord people didn't have to do. Uh, so, so Joe told me when I was talking to him that uh, they felt they should get in on the act. Is that right, Joe? Do you, you wanted to, <laughs> you wanted to get in on, yeah, I think so. Um, so John Powers particularly contacted a lot of noteworthies in the town and arranged for a meeting at the Wayside Inn on the 21st of May, 1963. He called it a committee of correspondence. And it's a day that will live in infamy because uh, these, there were 12 men who attended and they agreed that they would reform the Sudbury companies of militia and minute and they would march to, from Sudbury to Concord on Patriot's Day the next year, 1964. Uh, they were no doubt inspired by John Powers' uh, knowledge of history with all his stories and a desire to show Concord how it should be done. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I couldn't find a picture of all the founders together, but I've got their names and I do have uh, other pictures later on. But one of the things these, these men, these 12 men did um, at their first meeting was to uh, decide how they would be organized. And they decided they would have a colonel, a lieutenant colonel, an adjutant and quartermaster, and then they would have uh, field troops with three companies or three platoons, first, second, and third, and they would be led by a captain. There would be a horse troop, uh, and that left three, and they would be the troops. So. So it's a little top-heavy at this time, <laughs> but, but, but uh, it's, a, it's at least it's a start. Um, the, <laughs> um, so uh, uh, we'll, we'll get to meet some of these people in a little bit more detail later on, but um, their first colonel was Al Bonazzoli, who was very well known in the town for lots of work, and, and Royce Kaler was just telling me recently that he was very involved in, in, in um, social work in the town and also had a lot of important contacts in Framingham. But he was a, a veteran of the First World War, and, it, and he was in his 70s at the time, but it was felt that he, he should be the first colonel and, and uh, uh, play the role of Ezekiel Howe. Frank Sherman, who um, I think was moderator, was he at the time? Uh, is that right? Um, he was lieutenant colonel. Um, I, one story was that uh, some people wanted him to be colonel, but he turned it down because he... It, he was thinking of running for selectman or something. He thought it might spoil his chances if, if he was connected with this lot. <laughs> uh, Morris Fitzgerald, uh, who's a dentist uh, and uh, isn't here today, I don't think, is he? But um, um, uh, he's uh, still very, very active. And Joe Brown, of course, who's here today. Um, John Powers was captain of foot. Um, and uh, Rex Trailer, who was um, uh, the um, town's own cowboy, well, it was the perfect person to be the head of the horse. Um, the only picture I could find from round about that era uh, is this one. And I don't know if anyone else has a picture of, of, um, of the original group, but as most of you would probably know, let's see. There's Al Bonazzoli, uh, John Powers, Morris Fitzgerald, Roger, Roger Bump. Bob McLean. Oh, God, he looks young there, doesn't he? <laughs> Ira Amesbury. There's Joe Brown and Joe. Is that Joe? Bob Orham. That's Bob Orham. Great, because I've got another picture of him. So this is a few years later after that beginning, but, but not, not much longer. Now, um, 
Once these men got themselves together, decided how they were going to do this, they sent out a call for recruits. A lot of people, in fact, uh, someone was telling me today, were sort of uh, uh, pigeonholed or collared or whatever the expression is over here to, uh, 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 by friends. They say, come on, join, jo join the, uh, the militia. We're starting up the militia. We're going to march to Concord. And uh, an advertisement was put in the paper. And by February of 1964, 113 men had signed the muster roll. And here's a picture of them, uh, some of them at least, signing that roll. I, I presume this is at the Wayside Inn because there's Frank Kopeis, oh, uh, there's Al Bonazzoli, Rex Trailer, John Powers. And this muster roll, which they're signing, is still uh, exists. And there it is today. I, um, it was uh, being cared for at the Wayside Inn, if anyone wants to look at it later. Looks like they're signing uh, with a quill pen, and it looks like they were using old ink, which turns brown uh, very quickly. And, and you see that the top signatures are all thick brown lines. Uh, everything else was probably done with a ballpoint. I think they ran out of ink or something. Um, uh, now, in order to um, make the reenactment realistic, uh, a lot more work needed to be done, uh, more than just signing up over 100 men. Um, they. Uh, needed uh, costumes. Ah. Oh, now, um, one of the, the things they decided uh, early on was that they didn't want to have a uniform. Uh, this is a picture of the Concord Minutemen at the North Bridge uh, doing one of their reenactments. And as you can see, they all look very smart. Um, <laughs> they've all got the same, and, and even the ones who have fallen over wounded um, aren't going to get their ruffles uh, soiled because uh, they're being careful to take care of them. So it was decided uh, not to have uniforms, but they did want to have clothing that uh, was, was um, uh, at least uh, realistic. Um, they discovered that um, there's a, th it's a theatrical supply company in Lowell, Hooker and Howe, that uh, provided uniforms particularly. Um, uh, but if you wanted ordinary people's clothing, you really had to pretty much make it yourself. Uh, so they did get a lot of help from, from people uh, who came in and taught them how to make, make these clothing. Here's a picture of, uh, of some Minute Company wives uh, measuring some poor embarrassed person up uh, uh, for, for his outfit. Um, they needed um, uh, weapons, um, at least a, a few to sound the alarm. Not many people had flintlock muskets in those days. And Joe Brown, who was quartermaster, and he was also president of the um, uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce, um, discovered that there was a company in Belgium, in Liège, that uh, made flintlock muskets. Apparently, they, they made them uh, for the British government that used to send them out to some African uh, police force uh, in one of their colonies uh, because they didn't want them to have guns that would fire too many uh, shots in a short time. They didn't <laughs> figure this was a safer way to control it. Um, and Joe sent them some specifications, and they agreed to make um, the, the muskets. Um, and they were a very reasonable price. Uh, you could get a 35 to 37 inch barrel musket for $29, or a 50 inch barrel for $31. Uh, that's 1964. So that's not bad. Um, these, these muskets uh, became known as Belgian bombers, I think was the term. And, uh, they, they developed a reputation for being a little less than reliable. Uh, <laughs> and in fact, they're now forbidden in any public reenactment. You know, I think you'd be arrested if you were seen carrying one of them. Uh, but it got everybody going. I think in the early days, that's what uh, people got. They needed uh, a band. They needed musicians. And here's that man I showed you before, Fred Stone, who was still able to play the, his drum. And uh, he said, I'll, I'll form a fife and drum band. Uh, for, for your reenactment. And uh, he worked very hard learning a whole bunch of new colonial songs uh, and tunes uh, that would, would accompany the men on their march to Concord. Now, they needed a horse troop, and as I mentioned before, Sudbury was blessed with having its own cowboy, uh, Rex Trailer, who was a founding member. And he had no problem collecting fellow riders, and he was sure to be a, a great hit with all the kids in the, in the crowd. Um, they uh, 
Uh, yeah, there's a picture of, of Rex uh, with some of his pals uh, practicing um, horse riding. I, I, don't know, I don't know what else they practice. <laughs> What's that? Uh, well, I, I presume it's him. This looks like him. This is him, isn't it? Uh, that's Rex, right? Yeah, that's Rex. And I don't know who these gentlemen are. Anyway. Um, uh, they decided they wanted a military surgeon. Um, uh, and Morris Fitzgerald, as a dentist, a uh, qualified dentist, would have been the, the obvious choice. But uh, he, he, it was decided to, to give the role to Stuart Wiles, who was a, a vet. Uh, he thought that was a, a more appropriate and inspired choice. So eventually it all came together, April 1964, and they were ready to begin. Uh, they decided uh, that in addition to the march, they would have a regimental ball at the Wayside Inn um, the night before the march. And here's, here's Colonel Al Bolazzoli with his lady um, doing the foxtrot. Um, I, think, I think it was, I think it was um, Boris Fitzgerald told me that the first ball they had um, Rex Trainer said, oh, I can get a, a, a band for you. I know the perfect band, a colonial uh, group, and I'll bring them down. And they brought these guys down, and they, they were Paul Revere and the Raiders. And <laughs> it was, uh, uh, and I said, so we don't ever want to have them again. So, so um, but, it, but it still took a while, I think, before they, they got uh, uh, colonial contradancing. Um, uh, right, so now um, we've made it. It's, it's April 19th, 1964. It was a Sunday. Uh, in order to arrive at Concord in time for the ceremonies, and that was another twist, was that once Concord were aware that Sudbury was getting its uh, um, Minutemen group, they invited the Sudbury militiamen to join the celebration. And uh, apparently there was a little bit of a debate about whether they really wanted to do that, but in the end they decided, yes, we will. So... The, the celebrations weren't until the afternoon. So uh, in order to get there about the right time, uh, they decided that, that Sudbury would leave here about 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, a horseman rode into town to give the message that, uh, as uh, Abel Prescott did, that the British troops were moving towards Concord. And the uh, parish bell, I believe, was rung. Um, and drums were beat and muskets were fired for the first time in Sudbury probably for close to 200 years. Um, a fife and drum band had been assembled by Fred Stone and they started making lots of sound too. Kept the alarm going. Look, see, it's got all the people out. It's de definitely working. Everyone's coming to see what's going on. Um, in addition to Minutemen, their wives showed up in all their uh, refinery, um, and, and you may recognize some of those ladies, some of them are even here tonight. <laughs> um, so they were, they were ready, ready to go. Um, before they set off, they would have to have an invocation, and they got um, uh, William Simmerman, uh, Reverend William Simmerman, who I, I find out much about. Was he a local uh, Presbyterian. Pre pre preacher? Thank you. He is uh, giving uh, the prayer to help these men on their way. And there you can see them. There's, um, there's, uh, there's Al Bonazzoli, Frank Sherman, Morris Fitzgerald, Joe Brown, and John Powers. Don't they look serious? They, um, they're they're ready to go. So, uh, the, um, then once they were through with all those ceremonies, they were off. And there they go. It was a nice day, apparently. The sun was shining. Um, uh, it was a pleasant, uh, pleasant April day. And there you can see Al Sherman, Powers, and I'm not sure who that other man is behind, but they've all got, looks like they all went to ha uh, Hooker and Howe, the date for their for their um, uniforms. They look very, very nice and clean. Uh, there's our fife and drum band. Um, 
trudging through the puddles, uh, but keeping up and giving the men behind them the, the beat uh, so they can march in, in strict formation, as you can see here. <laughs> this is, this is another, another Sudbury tradition. This is, this is, this is, uh, <laughs> this is um, uh, what you call uh, order and discipline amongst the troops. So it's good. They're all, they're all holding their muskets in a different manner, which is, which is how it used to be done. Um, here are some more uh, troops uh, moving along. This is the uh, famous third company with their, with their flag, um, uh, um, which we have uh, a, a reproduction here. And as you can see, they weren't all necessarily um, in 18th century costumes, but it's close enough. Um, uh, they're, they're moving. There's even a, um, a wagon following behind for anybody who falls by the wayside. Um, the horse company, as you can see, they're being chased by a lot of children, no doubt wanting to get a look at uh, Rex trailer. Um, so they made it uh, to, um, to Concord. They, um, uh, now, in order to get to um, the, the Concord Parade uh, and the uh, celebration there, um, they had to enter Concord via the South Bridge and join the celebrants at the Armory. And that's where they, how they did the parade at that time. They started at the Armory, uh, marched to the North Bridge, where they had a um, reviewing stand. A lot of speeches were made, and everybody had to stand and listen to the speeches. And then they would march back. And it is reported that a lot of the troops, particularly members of the third company, didn't really enjoy listening to speeches and would, would make noises and various sounds. Uh, and in fact, some of them actually left the parade early and stopped at the Colonial Inn, <laughs> where they discovered a new beverage known as the Stonewall, which they later introduced to the Wayside Inn. Um, uh, they, uh, when they, after the march was over and they, everyone got back together again, uh, they all decided the march had been a success. They all enjoyed it, but and they should do it again next year, the following year. But they didn't like the route. It was not historically accurate as far as they knew. They you know, went over the South Bridge, which they didn't do. Um, and they didn't like standing around listening to speeches. They really didn't really enjoy that part of it at all. So for the next year, uh, the new colonel, uh, the new colonel every year was John Powers. And I guess uh, being a man of organization, uh, he decided uh, they would do a good job. And this is a picture of him from the paper supposedly finalizing his plans for the April 19th march. Now one thing that was decided at that time was that uh, some, a committee should be formed to decide on the route that they were going to take. And um, I don't know if this is the actual route committee at that time, but it is, it is a route committee. And they um, uh, looked, uh, they, they did a lot of work trying to uh, find old maps and, and routes that could possibly have been taken and decided how they were going to, to get there. And this is part of, of the map that they came up with. Um, here's the North Bridge, here's the Concord River, here's the Assabet, Elizabeth River. Uh, this is Barrett's farm. And this was, was their route. Now the South Bridge is here, and this is where they went before. They came up and went over the South Bridge into Concord. But this time, they were going to come up and go across the Assabet River somewhere along here. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it's not known exactly how the original Minutemen crossed, crossed the river. Um, there, there is a, a bridge further down. There was Derby Bridge. But th that probably would have meant backtracking somewhat and uh, uh, making the journey longer. And it was thought, well, maybe they, they somehow they got across the river uh, either by fording it um, or, or making a temporary bridge. Uh, uh, apparently a group of people went ahead, uh, paddled up and down the river and even tried walking across it and decided that probably wasn't a good idea. Um, so in the end they came up with the idea that what they should do is uh, make a pontoon bridge using canoes and wooden planks. And the bridge was designed by Ben Walker Sr and was built by Boy Scouts from the uh, Troop 60, Sudbury Troop 62. There they are, 
fine lads. And um, so that was it. The, the, the route was decided. Everybody was ready to go. And off they went. And there's Colonel Powers leading his men. Oh, one thing I didn't mention is that as the first year had beautiful weather, the next one had horrible weather. It snowed and um, was mid cold and miserable. But despite that, there was good turnout. And here you see them trudging across. I think that's the field coming up to uh, the river. Um, here's the fife and drum band, which has evolved a little bit since that time. And here they are coming up, uh, coming up to the river. And there's their bridge. As you can see, they, they got over it. Um, although they tended to move pretty fast, uh, but they all got over it. In fact, um, it was so impressive, it hit the, um, the newspapers, which said, Minutemen crossed the aspect successfully, not a soldier falls in. That's news, folks, that's big news. Nobody fell in the river. <laughs> no one fell in, and the bridge worked as planned. 101 marchers and boys of the Uxbridge Fife and Drum Corps crossed the Assabet River, obviously, the historic bridge. That's an interesting point. Um, there are rumors that drinking played a, a significant role in, in these marches, but I couldn't find any real documentation of that. Um, so, uh, the new bridge, uh, the new route and the bridge were a great success, um, but as before, uh, the experience at Concord was not such a good experience, and it was the beginning of a long, painful deterioration in relationships between the towns of Sudbury and Concord. First of all, the Sudbury men were told they couldn't cross the bridge as they weren't on the official lists of participants in 1775. Can you believe that? They would say that? <coughs> After intense negotiation, they were allowed to cross the bridge, and then they were allowed to join the other participants in the, 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 the manse field next to the bridge for the obligatory sp speechifying and listening. Sudbury forces didn't help the situation by firing and shouting as they crossed the bridge, <laughs> and, and they added fuel to the fire when some of the men placed at the rear of the group, reportedly belonging to the third company again, were firing their muskets during the speeches. <laughs> All, at, all attempts to control these culprits resulted in more shouting and firing, but it did result in an earlier ending of the ceremony, for which everybody was grateful. It is rumored that alcohol may have been involved in, in some of these instances, uh, but again, that was never proven. Now, Sabri was warned by the conquered authorities that if they did not improve their behavior, they would be banned from the celebration. <laughs> this warning fell on deaf ears. The following year, they followed the same route, and they solved the Concord problem by placing a man with a radio transmitter at the reviewing stand, while the rest of the company waited on the other side of the bridge out of view. As soon as the speeches were over, the man with the radio gave the all clear, and then they all marched over the bridge with much noise and gusto, much to the delight of the onlooking crowd. One result of this was that Concord decided to change its parade route so, so that everybody that the entire participation would march the same way over the bridge. The next year, the weather was so bad that, the Con that Concord cancelled its Patriot Day uh, activities. Now, this, this started an important Sudbury tradition that said they would march on April the 19th, whatever the weather, despite it, and despite what Concord would do. And uh, that's a tradition that has maintained to, to the present day. Um, they decided, however, not to use a bridge at that time because the weather was too bad and, and the river was much too high and they would go over by the uh, Route 2 uh, bridge. Um, their reception at Concord was somewhat bemused because there was hardly anybody there um, except the park rangers. Um, but after further negotiation with the park ranger, they were allowed to, to march over the bridge. Um, in subsequent years, interesting, interest and participation in the Sudbury companies continued to grow um, uh, and the participation increased quite dramatically with um, quite a few hundred uh, people joining. Um, th this was probably uh, helped by the oncoming bicentennial uh, of, the, of the beginning of the American Revolution, a lot of interest in that coming along. 
Several members uh, in the Sudbury group wanted to get involved in other activities other than the march and the ball, um, such as the July 4th parade, Memorial Day parade, and some other uh, outside activities. And there was a debate, apparently, in, in the group. Uh, some people wanted to do more things, some people didn't. And so to solve that um, uh, and not break their constitution, uh, uh, I tried to find a constitution for the Minutemen that supposedly existed. It doesn't exist as far as I can find, but from what I understand, the, the, the constitution consisted of four things. Uh, no organization, no bylaws, no uniform, and two events, the march and the ball. Um, so to solve this problem of doing other things, they formed a, what was called the Alarm Company, which is a, a group of anybody who wanted to participate, they could do it, but they had to sort of uh, make the arrangements on their own. Um, the other thing that happened uh, in the ensuing time were uh, the, not only the increase in involvement and a lot of people, but interesting uh, involvement of some, some real characters. Uh, the most significant one is this man, and anyone who knows who that is? That's, that's the man, Les Longworth, who um, is a well-known uh, raconteur, bon, bon vivant, and artist. Uh, and his pal, this guy, that's Leo? Yeah, Leo Xiao, who formed sort of a, a dynamic duo uh, and kept the, um, the uh, uh, fun and the humor of, of, the, of, of the company going very well. Um, Les is... Uh, uh, Competence as, as, as an artist um, is somewhat overshadowed by the fact that he not only did excellent artwork, but he was a, a wonderful cartoonist. And this is sort of illustrated in one of his uh, uh, self-portraits. Uh, um, there's a copy of a book he, he put together called the uh, Colonel's uh, Coloring Book, which unfortunately isn't complete. But uh, if you want to look at some more of his pictures, you'll see them there. But, um, but this, is, this is typical of his style. Um, uh, um, in 1968, uh, the, the company expanded uh, for the first time and admitted, uh, up until that time, the only members were people from the town of Sudbury. Uh, after 1968, people from the town of Wayland, which at the time was East Sudbury, um, at the time of the revolution was East Sudbury, um, were allowed to form, uh, were admitted to form an East Side company, uh, which uh, increased the numbers quite a bit. Uh, unfortunately, Adding on the East Side Company didn't improve relations with Concord, um, uh, as the marches tended to be just as noisy and boisterous uh, and out of control uh, as, as, all, as ever. Um, it got so bad that one year, um, Concord was so fed up with Sudbury that they sent one of their police officers down to restore law and order. And this poor unfortunate officer was known as Sergeant Hanley, uh, we don't have a picture of him, but um, Les Longworth sort of uh, draws a picture of, of, of uh, how it might have looked. Uh, this is Paul Sergeant Hanley trying to, uh, trying to control the men. Um, uh, um, in, in 1969, um, uh, the state decided that it didn't have enough three-day holidays, so it decided to... Um, uh, move Patriot's Day to, from April the 19th to the third Monday in April. And that was a good move for Sudbury because it meant, as they were committed to marching on the 19th, it meant they didn't have to deal with the conquered uh, celebration uh, as, as often as they would. Um, and there'd be less confrontation with the authorities. Although they still had to deal with the National Park um, rangers when it came to crossing the bridge. Uh, fortunately, um, uh, the colonels at that time uh, were very good at uh, negotiating their way out of all sorts of situations. And this is Les Longworth's um, uh, interpretation of how, um, I think this is Roger Bump, isn't it? Uh, uh, um, uh, persuaded the ranger that it was okay to let these lads across the bridge. They were harmless and uh, weren't going to cause any trouble. And as you can see, the uh, thing that uh, I, I like, if you look at the men on, on the bridge, they are... They <laughs> are having, having a great time. <laughs> so, so <laughs> um, it's not quite like that anymore. Um, now, in addition to an artist in Les Longworth, uh, Sudbury also had a poet, a poet laureate by the name of Ira Amesbury. And um, uh, he uh, um, 
comment on the fact that eventually um, Sergeant Hanley and, and the Concord police were able to <coughs> subdue the Sudbury Minutemen to the point that they couldn't just uh, walk into the town and fire their muskets and, and just do whatever they liked. And Ira wrote a poem, which I'll read, it's very, not very long, uh, summing up the, the mood at that time. It's called The Silenced Majority. 19th of April, time to play the game. Celebration at the bridge concluding. Toy soldiers, not a wig askew, wound up and ready to go. The Minuteman statue looking down in amusement. Through all this, a jarring note. Speeches were shattered with muskets erupting, echoes rattling down the hillside. Their numbers reduced, crows wheeled in distress against the leaden sky to convey the news of Sudbury approaching. Toy soldiers sprung their springs and smoothed their lace in apprehension. Sergeant Hanley of the local fuzz, frozen with fear, managed to squeak, everybody out, the rebels are coming. This is not a drill. Sound the alarm and lock up your women. Sudbury will be the death of me. <laughs> Down they came, 300 strong, looking fresh from a raid on a goodwill box. Eyes a glitter and muskets hot. They shot at will and shot at random, full of f fight and spirits, stumbling over the bridge and up to the road. Don't shoot until you see the red of his eyes, the colonel <laughs> screamed. Right out in front, no place to hide. It was a hollow glory. No need to fire. The charade was over. Not a soul was around. Sergeant Hanley had won the game. So, so things sort of calmed down uh, a little bit uh, um, uh, for a while. Um, uh, our Ainsbury, uh, uh, the poet, uh, became a colonel in 1972, and it would have been a perfect year except for one flaw. Uh, it was decided to go back and repeat crossing the river again. Um, but as the water level was high and unsuitable for a pontoon bridge, it was decided they would make a raft. It seemed like a good idea at the time. And uh, the company's engineers set to making a craft using canoes and wooden boards pulled by a cable. It all started so well. The first two crossings were smooth, but a little slower than was uh, required to get everybody across the river in time uh, uh, to get to the bridge. So for the third crossing, they put an extra man on the boat and pulled a little harder on the cable. <laughs> it started out OK, but because of the extra weight and the extra speed, the um, craft tipped over <laughs> and <laughs> took on water. Uh, they kept on pulling, and it just went in more and more. <laughs> Finally, it sunk completely. <laughs> Muskets were lost, um, and and uh, um, and reputations were, were severely damaged. Um, they they uh, decided there wouldn't be any more river crossings, but they had to find out who was responsible for for causing this terrible tragedy. And uh, there, there was even a, a trial was had, and they decided that the person who was responsible was someone called Isaac Ferndock. But he apparently absconded before his photo could be taken. But Les Longworth did leave a likeness of, of him for us. Woo. No, it's not there. But anyway, it, I'll show it. It might come later. No, that wasn't it. Um, ah, this is it. There's Isaac Ferndock. Yeah, the other, that, that's the man who's responsible. Um, this picture was um, uh, Les Longworth's interpretation of the events. And there's Ira Amesbury. Uh, there's Les Longworth and his pal Leo Xiao. And there's the uh, unfortunate sinking Minutemen <laughs> being, being cheered on by their, their comrades uh, who decided they would probably take the bridge. Um, so. Uh, so there's, there's Isaac Ferndock. Um, as I said, there have been no more river crossings since that time. I think once, once was enough. But since that time, the marches have been pretty uneventful. No real tragedies, uh, uh, pretty much. Um, certainly not uh, on the march. Uh, oops, you okay? <laughs> um, so the next important event as you'd expect, was the bicentennial, 17, 1975, 200 years after the uh, original uh, event. 
and nothing was allowed to go wrong for that. Now, fortunately, uh, the colonel for that event was Palmer True, who you see here, accompanied by his, his officers, Cornell Gray, and this, this man, a young-looking Joe Bausk. Here's Ira Amesbury. Um, Russ Kirby, yeah, Russ Kirby. That's Leo, is it? The long-haired... Uh, <laughs> and Ray Clark here. And here they are. You can see they're deeply, seriously planning the march where nothing could possibly go wrong. Um, uh, the, the reason nothing could possibly go wrong is because that the, being the bicentennial, it was going to be a big, a big event. Everyone was going to be there, including the president, Gerald Ford, who was going to speak at the North Bridge. Um, all musket men were required to undergo safety training uh, at the Framingham Armory and get a qualification card to show that they had uh, qualified to uh, and were safe to, to, to participate. Um, and amazingly, all the Sudbury Minutemen qualified and got a card. Uh, and they, on the, on the day of the march, they um, had over 400 participants, 400 to 500 somewhere, and they set off um, for Concord. And here they go. The newspaper captured that uh, historic moment as you see them. as Palmer, True, Joe Bausk, Frank Kopice, and Cornell Gray. And um, they set off uh, very sternly and they kept going. They went through the woods and uh, it looked like um, Palmer True saying, you know, is my, are my tr trousers too tight or something? And Joe is saying, no, <laughs> no, they look fine to me. <laughs> God, I said, I don't know. And the rest of the troops kept on marching, as you can see, in strict military formation, um, uh, all holding their muskets in different ways and uh, having a, a great time. There's some more high, highly drilled and organized. And they, they, they kept on coming and coming. And then finally, um, uh, they were also accompanied by uh, the largest horse troop they've ever had, far more than ever turned up on, on 1775. Um, but I don't think Rex Trailer was with them then, is that right? I, I could see his, his name anywhere. So when they got to the bridge, they were the first group to arrive, because they'd left earlier than usual. And so they arrived before anybody else, so they had the bridge all to themselves. And there they are marching across. Magnificent sight. Um, there's the colonel, there's, there's lieutenant, and other officers going across, followed by the fife and drum, which is quite uh, large now, and, and the rest of the massed forces. Um, it was a, uh, a, a, a phenomenal sight, very impressive, particularly to, uh, to the newspapers. And, and this is quite uh, amazing. The South Middlesex Sunday News uh, shows a picture of them at the bridge saying, Sudbury Minutemen, who make the march to Concord every year, cross Old North Bridge on the 20th anniversary in a characteristic non-military fashion. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the word is out, you know, the reputation is there. Um, they must have, uh, uh, oh, uh, the, the, the local paper, Sudbury paper, uh, just simply commented on just how many people showed up, tremendous numbers. So Les uh, Longworth uh, immortalized this time with Palmer True presenting himself to the Concord authorities saying, tell the president to relax, his honor guard is here. And there they are, they're relaxed as well. Not only there. <laughs> so it was all going so well. Um, uh, they were first to arrive, so they were placed near the rear of the muster field, and then they were required to wait patiently for all the speeches, particularly the one by that inspirational orator, <coughs> General Ford. And it was going so well that even the Concord police were beginning to relax. And then suddenly, and there, and there, there is uh, General Ford, and here at the front you can see these must be the Concord Minutemen because they've all got the same uniforms on. And I suspect the Sudbury guys, were they back here somewhere? Back here. They pushed them all the way to the back. Well. Um, as I said, it was all going so well, 
Uh, everyone was relaxed, and all of a sudden, from the back of the Sudbury contingent, a musket shot was fired. <laughs> Unfortunately, the security guards didn't see the funny side, and the poor man was summarily dealt with. Relationships between Sudbury and Concord took another nosedive, <laughs> from which we have never fully recovered. We're still, we're still not allowed to fire uh, muskets uh, until we reach the national park, and then and we have to be accompanied by a police cruiser as we as we drive through as we march through the town. When I heard this story, I was deeply touched, with a sense of sympathy for the poor miserable minute man who, in a moment of reckless abandon, made an error that has affected so many lives. It reminded me of Coleridge's tale of the ancient mariner, which tells of how a ship was happily travelling south towards the equator, and was followed by an albatross. Everything was going well until the mariner shoots the uh, albatross and kills him with his crossbow. Following this, disaster upon disaster, until everyone dies, leaving the ancient mariner alone to tell his story, to atone for his mistake by trying to get somebody to listen to him. Now, I can't compete with Ira Amesbury in writing poetry, but I did write down a few words of my own to try to express this, this very emotive feeling of this poor man. It's called The Rhyme of the Ancient Minuteman. <laughs> tis, of an ancient minute, tis of an ancient Minuteman who stoppeth one of three from entering the wayside inn to join the revelry. Please hear my tale of pain and woe. Twill only take a minute. Here, drink this glass of dark brown ale. When you're ready, I'll begin it. Twas April 1975 the bicentenary of the battle. We all set off for Concord to the sound of our muskets rattle. We fired in volleys with double loads so that everyone could hear us. Our hearts were full of hope and cheer, our canteens full of spirit. And as we marched, we saw a squirrel following us through the trees. He seemed to bring us all good luck, so we fed him nuts and peas. When we arrived at the old North Bridge, a crowd by the river stood. And President Ford gave a very long speech, but it wasn't very good. <laughs> well, my mind began to wander, and I looked up to the sky. Twas then I saw the squirrel sitting on a branch nearby. What happened next is a mystery. I somehow lost my head. I must confess, with my brown bess, I shot the squirrel dead. <laughs> the next thing I remember, I was lying on the grass with 16 policemen on my chest and a truncheon up my undervest. <laughs> well, they frisked me and they took my prints and they took down my particulars. They said, you must all go back to Sudbury. Your behavior is ridiculous. My comrades found the squirrel. Its poor body was a wreck. They also found some old brown string and they tied it round my neck. <laughs> and as we trudged our way back home, our heads were hanging low. Then dark clouds gathered overhead and the pouring rain did flow. But they'd taken all our canteens and they'd poured them down the sink. So there was water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. <laughs> My comrades looked like zombies as they struggled against the wind. They too were being punished, though I was the one who sinned. Since then we'd been forbidden to fire in conquered town, and all the policemen mock us as we pace their sacred ground. So now every April my story I must tell to some unsuspecting stranger until I break this spell. For not, un not until I've paid my penance and atoned for causing pain will our company march through Concord with their muskets rattling again. So, since that time, it's all been... <laughs> no, 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 no applause, just, just the ten yard start, that's, that's all I want. Um, so since that time, that was the peak probably of the Sudbury Minute Militia's uh, uh, history. It was a, must have been a fabulous year. Um, since that time, the numbers of participants has dropped down somewhat, as you might expect, uh, but we're still, still going strong. It was 50 years now, and we still repeat the march every year. We haven't missed a year. We still have the balls, and we still have uh, many other activities. I'd just like to finish up by uh, th showing a few slides of what we do uh, in our recent marches. We start now in Wayland, uh, at 4 o'clock in the morning, when it's dark and we need some light and uh, one of our ex-colonels uh, uh, used to run a, a, a hearth, a fire, fire 
uh, making business. And so he's got this device that allows us to see in the dark. And um, uh, here's Roger Backman, one of the east side colonels, um, uh, reading the, the, the muster roll of the men who, who showed up uh, on April 19th in East Sudbury. There he is. Hey, take a bow. It's Roger. Wonderful. We go down to the old training ground on Gleason Lane, fire volley support, and as you can see, it's raining at the time, but that doesn't matter. We keep going. Um, then we go to the Sudbury Centre where we meet up with lots of other people that we know. There's Bob Orham and, of course, uh, Lee Swanson, who's uh, been a member for a long time. Um, if we're lucky, if we know someone with a horse, they will uh, play the role of um, Prescott and bring the, the news of what's happening in Concord, and we will uh, give our invocation, and we will set off. It's getting lighter now. We stop by the Revolutionary Cemetery. We play, uh, pay, uh, fire a salute um, for the revolutionary soldiers who are buried there. Um, Deacon Haynes, Asahel Reed, and Ezekiel Howe, and, and many others who, who unfortunately didn't die at that time. When we get to the Concord line, we, we're not allowed to fire anymore. So we, we take the opportunity of, of, of lining up, uh, loading our muskets as, as much as we can and firing at the same time, just to let the people know we're coming. Um, <laughs> if you look carefully, you'll see in the distance there's a police cruiser down here, yeah. keep, <laughs> keeping a safe distance from, from us. And then when we get to the bridge, uh, because it's April 19th, it's usually most days of the week uh, fairly quiet, not too many people, uh, but we, we are uh, allowed to fire our salute off the bridge uh, under the uh, careful eye of, of the uh, park ranger, who looks like he's covering his ears up. I, I, I'm not sure why. Uh, then we go back to the inn, um, and we change the flag over the door, and we fire some more salutes, because we like to do that sort of thing. We still have our balls. We now have two balls, one uh, the regimental ball in April and an, uh, a 12th night ball on 12th night or in January. And we also have our fair. I didn't mention it, but in 1971, uh, the company started its first fair, um, colonial fair at the Wayside Inn, uh, with muster of fife and drums bands from all around uh, New England. Um, and they're always led by the Sudbury ancient uh, Fife and drum band, as you can see it marching here. And all our minute men take the opportunity to uh, display some of their marvelous military proficiency. And we have games for the children, and we're always, always looking for recruits, and so here's a chance to get some there. <laughs> One of the nice traditions that I enjoy is that all the colonels um, meet uh, the night before the march, April 18th, for, for a dinner, which has been sponsored by the Wayside Inn since the very early years. And it's the only time uh, of the year when all these mugs that you see hanging on the ceiling are taken down uh, and used. And it's a nice occasion because a lot of the colonels who go back many, many years um, meet. Uh, we have dinner, we talk, and we uh, get ready for, for the march the next day. And this is my last slide, and I'd like to... Uh, uh, this is, again, we're, we're all having a good time at the Colonel's dinner, and I'd like to thank some of the people in the audience. Here's Joe Brown. Thank you, Joe, for all your help with this. There's Joe Bouse. Thank you, Joe. And there's Hal Cutler. Um, and that's me. So before, um, I'd like to end with a song. You lucky people are going to be, be um, given the opportunity to hear this song for the first time in public. It's called the Colonel's Dinner Song. Uh, and um, oh, very important because it's, uh, it sort of sums up for me what I like about that. Really, 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 really.
I think it's on. Is it on? Is it on? I might say a word? Yes. You've never said one word. My name is. <laughs> as, as Tony said, no respect whatsoever. Um, it's wonderful to be here. You'll find my sainted mother in the front row. Uh, she and my dad were there. At the first march in 1964, you noticed in the slides, you might have recognized it, it was the corner of Route 117 and Dakin and Pantry Roads before there was even a, a fire station. And uh, my dad took those slides, which uh, Tony put into his uh, wonderful slideshow. Well, <laughs> quite all right, Colonel. Um, I was one of the Boy Scouts in 1965 who built that fine canoe bridge which did not swamp. And in 1966, the following year, I was one uh, of the Boy Scouts in the uh, group photo with uh, Troop 62 and Pete Redding. Uh, Pete and his two sons wearing the lovely turquoise tricorns. Uh, after that picture was taken, went into uh, 
the end of the Boston Marathon and represented Sudbury at the Prudential. Uh, it's an honor to be this year's Sudbury Colonel. And I want to uh, say that uh, it'll, be a, uh, it'll be a relief in five months when the next Colonel succeeds me. But uh, I think I will also miss it. And uh, you can see why. This has been a, a, a terrific 50 years that the modern companies have, uh, uh, have, have put in the history books. And uh, I just want to say it's, uh, it's, a great, it's a great honor to represent the, uh, all the Sudbury commanders from, from, 19, or from 1639. Uh, and uh, especially the um, 49 colonels, to represent the 49 colonels who have gone on before me. So I would like to pledge to you all that I will endeavor and strive to uh, uphold the honor of the uh, citizens of Sudbury, the town of Sudbury, and uh, the especially uh, the founders and the colonels who are here today, um, and uh, to continue in the, uh, the, the fine example that has been set before me. Uh, as you've seen in Tony's great slideshow. So thank you very much, uh, Colonel, Colonel Hal Cutler. Well, what, what I'd like to do is have a mechanism for recognizing those of you in the audience who have been participants in the Sudbury Companies since 1964. And we're going to call it the last man standing routine. If you've, been, if you've made the march to Concord, and some of you women assisted on the March to Concord because one of the reasons, one of the reasons the Minute Companies continue to this day, by the way, Concord's Minute Company has gone out of business. One reason Sudbury continues is because it's been a great family activity. So men and women who've made the March to Concord or supported the March to Concord all stand up and then we'll sit you down starting with 2012. We'll see, who, we'll see who the last man standing is. Okay, uh, I'm going to just count backwards. Sit down when you hear your, your first year number. Uh, 2012, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7. Sit down w when your number, the, the year you started, is called. We're going to look for the last person standing. We know who that might be. Well, there's actually a couple. Um, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, 2000, 99, 98, 97, 96, 95, 94, 93, 92, 91, 90, um, 89, 88, 87, 86, 85, 84, 83, 82, 81, 80, 79, 78, 77, 76, 75, 74, 73, 72, 71, 70, 69, 68, 67, 66, 65, 64, these people must be, uh, well, almost d charter members, 64. Royce Kaler, Joe Brown, Joe and Ruth Brown. Pretty great to see them here. And Joe, over there. By the way, many of their names are on this roster. This is the roster that uh, was signed in 1964 of the men that made the march. And uh, several of these people are on here. There's a 67 roster behind it that has even more people on it. Anyway. Do you have anything further to say? Um, are there any questions? Yes, Frank. Uh, I have uh, a, a comment, a couple of comments, and then a question. Um, I, w I went on the uh, 1975 march, and uh, as I recall, uh, we were pretty well behaved. Uh, that this was the year that the president was there, and they didn't. Nobody fired a gun until we were going over the bridge, and uh, 
the the man who fired a gun was actually uh, apprehended by the police because they were they were pretty serious about it then because the president was there, and if I recall correctly, uh, it was Ira Amesbury's uh, son. <laughs> and uh, what? Was oh, Steve Porter? Oh, okay. I, I Keith Porter. Okay, I'm sorry. The other thing is that uh, we actually were an honor guard uh, that day, as I recall. They had us standing behind the, the stone wall uh, that led up to the um, Minuteman statue. And uh, after uh, President, either before or after President Ford gave his talk, he came along and shook some of our hands. He actually shook my hand and uh, the picture of that in, in the, the 11 o'clock news. Uh, the, the question that I had is that one year I was, uh, what I think they called them ensigns, you carried the flag. And if I recall correctly, there was a flag that had a don't tread on me, it was a, a snake. It, do you still have it? It's not in those flags, but do, is that flag still around? Yeah. It is. It is. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, any other thoughts, comments? How many how many members are there? I, yeah, I see Royce. How many members are there now, um, currently? We have 220 on our mailing list. Uh, generally, at a muster, we'll get 40. Uh, that's the uh, first Monday of every month uh, at the Wayside Inn, and um, we'll probably get 60 on the March. Actually, what we heard today was just the tip of the, the tip of the iceberg of what went on. There were so many activities that took place and so many friendships that took place that in the farming of the Minute and Militia Company. Uh, the McLeans and the Vouse became good friends, drinking buddies and whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Brett Vouse, I used to play Mr. Plimpton at the Loring Passage, and. I'd send my son over to Ira Amesbury, who played at the sextant at the Unitarian Church, to ring the bell to alarm citizens that the British were coming. And uh, there's one, we went to reenactments up to Fort Number no. Four. I don't know if you ever heard of Fort Number no. Four. A and then we went to reenactments down at Valley Forge and to the South Meeting House and listen to Rex Trailer talk about the tea tax and how we are being squashed. And one thing I kept on asking myself, if I lived back then, would I have grabbed my gun for just a tea tax? And I said, there must be more to it. So I was reading back, and in 1704, the British passed the Navigation Act saying that we, our ships, could not bring goods from China to the colonies. We had to bring it to England, buy it from England, and then bring it here. And of course, John Hancock became a well-known smuggler. And they, uh, there was this animosity toward the British that started basically back in 1704, and it just grew and grew and grew. And when they wanted to harbor troops in Boston, that was the end of it. And when they said we couldn't bear arms, then the kettle flew off the top. You hear that, Mr. Britt? <laughs> um, OK, I think that's probably it. Um, there, oh, there's somebody else? Oh, I was going to say that. Okay. <laughs> um, we have refreshments. We have a sales ta table that Terry was um, very nicely showing books that I think you may find interesting. Um, and we also want to encourage you to join the Sudbury Historical Society uh, if you are not already a member. Um, and I think you can get a um, form, and we'll take your check. Thank you. <laughs>